Um, Everybody can hear you now, Bill. Uh, you're on speakers. We're just bringing up. Uh, okay, fantastic. James is just. I have a few uh, uh, things to show after the slide presentation. By the way, too. I'm just going to. I'm just going to move the camera a bit closer, actually. So. Let's see if this works. No, he's not on screen as well. No, I can't. Unfortunately, because the Skype's on yours. I could do Skype on here as well, but it's probably. No, it's, it's working. That's yeah. It's not going to make it up the complicated. There's a great space there. Uh, one of the fellows on uh, on the BATC chat room, uh, Trevor, mentioned that your uh, meeting play rapes horror movie set. <laughs> you should see outside. Yeah. <laughs> it is a horror movie outside. <laughs> UK Hus zombies or. <laughs> So we're ready. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll press the button. Yeah, okay, we're ready for you, Bill. If you just want to tell us the uh, next slide, and we'll uh, we'll do that for you. All right, very fine. Well, um, I'm going to talk about uh, a multi-mode transmitter that I've been working on for some time. And the uh, next slide. Here <laughs> you go. The yeah, top one that you see is a uh, GPS. Uh, High altitude GPS that I've uh, designed to uh, work uh, under varying conditions. It's guaranteed to go above 60,000 feet. It actually goes to 139,000 feet. Uh, um, and it, it's uh, got a several acts uh, that uh, makes it uh, very sensitive. It'll actually work pointing upside down. In fact, we uh, at the local university, uh, the students put my payload on upside down and it worked just fine. So <laughs> it only loses about 3 dB when it's upside down. Uh, the transmitter board below is a uh, um, very interesting uh, device that uses a Cypress TSOC instead of. Uh, I, I do like to use the Atmel theory. AVR series, but uh, for our Cypress P this time, it has a lot of mixed mode uh, capability. So uh, I can get upwards of a watt on HF and about 300 milliwatts on VHF with this. It's uh, frequency agile. Uh, depending on the output filter, I can uh, put it anywhere from 80, 80 meters all the way up to 2 meters. And it'll do uh, a variety of different things. It'll do teletype, Morse code, and Hellschreiber. And it'll actually do slow scan, slow scan. Shortly, I'll have it actually be able to do APRS packet. So it'll transmit on uh, the packet frequency and then shift to a clear channel away from the APRS network. I know that doesn't apply there. Uh, since you can't use that in uh, the UK, but uh, for those of you listening outside the area, that's what my plan will be. Uh, next slide. This is the uh, schematic of the transmitter. Uh, as you can see, it's uh, it has the typical sensors of uh, uh, battery voltage. Uh, internal temperature, I can put an external temperature sensor, uh, I can also uh, sample pressure or ambient light, uh, any number of sensors that you can put on the outside. Uh, I'm running everything at 3.3 volts because that's what the, the uh, frequency synthesizer chip likes to run at in my uh, clock reference. I'm using a, a very unique way of uh, frequency shift keying here, which also allows you to uh, uh, FM modulate this. Um, you'll note the uh, reference oscillator is a voltage control crystal oscillator. And the output of the PSOC, they actually have a DAC output module inside the chip. And so I just vary the control voltage onto the uh, reference <coughs> clock to synthesizer, and I can create a teletype, I can do multi sh frequency shift key modes. Uh, for example, on domino, on an HF frequency, that's an 18-tone uh, 
mode, I actually can shift it 10 hertz at a time, direct, rather than modulating it. Uh, so it's a really a neat way of doing that kind of uh, frequency shift key mode directly on HF. And on VHF, I uh, just uh, uh, modulate it back, feed a uh, audio signal uh, into this, and, and it does direction directly. It's direct FM. And it cuts down on a lot of complexity of the circuitry. That uh, clock synthesizer is also made by uh, Cypress, who also makes the PSOC. And that uh, synthesizer chip puts out about 20 milliwatts all, all by itself. I've actually flown this times on the VHF bands uh, on two meters with just 20 milliwatts. And uh, with uh, you can get uh, great, great signals on that. I've had reception at 400 miles, 25 mil effect. My record for uh, reception from a balloon is 508 miles. And I did that with this transmitter flying over Missouri, which is 508 miles away, uh, running 25 milliwatts on 2 meter FM. Now, I will preface that with one thing. I live on a 500-foot mountain, and uh, I'm on the <laughs> I have antennas only 8 feet, so uh, it's as if I have a 508-foot tall antenna. And as we all know, antenna height is everything. I use a Class C amplifier, although on the HF bands uh, I've been running a, uh, a 2N7000 small FET, which cost about 50 cents. And uh, that little FET, uh, a VN10K will also work if you're more familiar with that part. Uh, that FET will put out a watt on uh, 40 meters and 30 meters and 20 meters. So uh, that's Class E, and it's very efficient. On the higher frequencies, about 20 meters, I typically go with Class C. We just recently uh, did a flight up in Indiana with a uh, meter burst, and I was able to hear it at 420 miles beautifully. So um, that's line of sight. I wasn't ship that day. And I'm putting this on 10 meters in the near future. 10 meters has been wide open every morning to the UK and Europe, and in the evening to Australia. Australia. So you can potentially get on duration on a 10 meter transmitter with the sunspot being as it is now. Worldwide communications with one watt. So uh, next slide. Uh, this is how the Cypress PSOC uh, operates. It's, it takes a little bit of a learning curve, uh, but it's really unique. Um, it's like a schematic capture to design how the modules connect within the part. And so you can uh, put analog modules and the PWM and uh, they have an analog filter. Uh, I actually generate the audio tones when I'm in my module. Uh, I start with PWMs first and then I uh, um, then I run it through an audio filter and I get a sine wave. So it saves a lot of overhead <coughs> from trying to do an interrupt based any sine wave. Um, so that's one, just one of the neat things about the Cypress ALI. And it has A to D modules, DAC modules, timer module. And you put this all into the schematic capture to set up the pins. And, and it's somewhat limited as to what pins you can do for different modules. But there's a lot of a variety of what, what pins you can choose. Uh, next slide. And the uh, and then once you set up the chip, you program it in standard C to access those modules in the pin. So uh, the IDE for that Cypress provides is a free program, very capable. And uh, it, uh, it 
is just traditional C programming at that point. Um, the program environment, it works pretty well. Um, this is the Hellschreiber transmission. Hellschreiber is a very interesting mode. It's been around since the 30s as a, as a secret code uh, in the 30s. And uh, it's, uh, it's like a facsimile. Uh, as you can see, uh, it paints the characters perfectly. And uh, it's 8.163 milliseconds per pixel. So if it's a key down, you get a black, black pixel. If it's a key up, you get a just paint perfectly one little row at a time. And uh, very simple. You just uh, key the transmitter off. The most common part is designing the lookup table for the characters. But uh, um, I have examples of that. I can send to those the rest of them trying Hellschreiber. Uh, next, uh, next slide. By the way, the reason Hellschreiber is, is interesting is that it's very weak signal, so you don't need a lot of power, and your eyes actually filter out uh, the noise. So you're, you're actually, it's a visual filter. Uh, this is the mode that I absolutely love, uh, Domino EX. It was developed uh, in uh, uh, New Zealand. And uh, the mode I most typically use is Domino EX 16 for HF communications and Domino EX 22 for uh, VHF. Uh, 22 is quite, you can see from the speed there. 140 words per minute. It's a really, really is quite a good effects mode. The nice thing about it, it will have perfect copy down to minus 13 dB below the noise level. So you can get an extremely, you can just barely see the signal in the waterfall and barely hear it, and you'll still get perfect copy. So as opposed to packet or teletype. It is an uh, order of magnitude more uh, sensitive than uh, teletype. As you probably notice with teletype, as soon as you get some noise into it and you get down towards the noise level, it doesn't work too well. So, uh, uh, by the way, I also use a 300 baud uh, ASCII teletype on VHF, and I find about 110 baud works pretty well on HF uh, or 50 baud. Those are the two I typically use on each app. But uh, I still transmit teletype. I typically do Domino EX and then follow it with uh, teletype. And then sometimes a Morse code and uh, giving the lat long and Morse code and altitude. And uh, sometimes I'll try. Those are kind of my work preference. Um, but this is a neat, neat mode. It's 18 tones. and. Uh, uh, that really works great. Uh, next slide. <coughs> the nice thing about Domino is that of all the multi-frequency shift key modes, it is the most, it, it's the easiest one to implement in a microcontroller. You don't have to go through all the convoluted uh, schemes that, and floating point math. There's no floating point math necessary. You just use a lookup table for the barcode uh, language. Ah, you're probably all familiar with this program. <laughs> um, this is an example of a balloon on, on 40 meters. Uh, this particular balloon was received 2,000 miles away. It actually landed in East Georgia, which is about 200 to me. Uh, we lost the uh, signal at about 10,000 feet through the ground wave direct reception. And about a half hour later, so we weren't quite sure exactly where it landed. Half hour later, a guy in California emails me and says, uh, copy your balloon, here's the telemetry from 2,200 miles away. And it was on the ground, he copied it, it was hanging in. So uh, that's the real nice thing, over the horizon telemetry. And uh, that's why I enjoy the HF uh, bands. Uh, in the waterfall there to the right, you'll see what a Domino EX transmission looks like. Uh, next slide. <coughs> and of course, you're all familiar with this. Here's a couple of flights that uh, we've done recently. And uh, 
see the mirror. Catch up to uh, The uh, first flight uh, was done during field day on the top there. I told the uh, Huntsville Amateur Radio Club when they were out during their field day exercise. Um, and field day in the U.S. is where everybody gets out and operates under emergency power and we try to talk to as many as we can. Uh, I don't know if you do the similar thing in the U.K., but uh, basically yeah. it's, a, it's a way to have a big cookout and a party out in a field somewhere and then occasionally operate the radios. But when I told the, uh, the field day, the radio club, that I was going to land the balloon on them. And we, in fact, missed them by three quarters of a mile. <laughs> it, it floated directly over the field day site. They watched the parachute for about 15 minutes. Uh, first, the winds were ideal. We landed about eight miles from the launch point. <coughs> More typically, the bottom uh, scene shows uh, about an 80 mile, mile down. We landed these most of the time out here. Uh, how many of you have seen the movie <laughs> Deliverance? We land in Deliverance country all the time. <laughs> we just be careful not to get too close to the banjo music and the chainsaws. <laughs> um, this is an interesting flight. Perhaps some of you can explain it, uh, how the car got out. <laughs> it's the chase boat. Ah, oh, it's the chase boat, okay. <laughs> Getting the icons updated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was it was it recovered? Oh, <laughs> oh well. <laughs> well. They did make all the amphicar, so you could just drive right out with that. Okay, next slide. This is uh, one of the flights we did on the HF. Uh, we landed. Uh, you notice we had quite a number of ground stations. So, uh, uh, space air is becoming popular due to these HF flights here in the U.S. Uh, that particular flight, you see, landed 10 miles in the Atlantic Ocean. That was quite a long flight. That was uh, about 400 miles downrange. Uh, next slide. This is what we did for uh, uh, Pell City High School. Uh, there was actually two uh, two classrooms participated. We had student experiments, uh, uh, all kinds of. Uh, hang on, just a minute. Getting some feedback here. Let me turn the main mic down. I don't want the. Get feedback from feedback. Uh, anyway, the. Uh, Um, we had campers on board, student experiments, uh, about $1,000 worth of equipment, and uh, I had three trackers and a fine spot. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I didn't weigh all the student experiments because uh, they were still uh, passing a few of them out to me and adding some experiments and putting in bananas and apples and I don't know what all. And so uh, the weights didn't uh, add up just right. I ended up launching with two ounces of positive lift with a uh, nine pound uh, payload. The ascent rate was 200 feet per minute, which is uh, quite low as you might expect. And it lasted seven and a half hours and went 600 miles down range and landed, actually splashed down 100 miles out to sea off the coast of Jacksonville, Florida. So. We were on our way. Uh, next slide. By the way, that uh, telemetry of the splashdown was received from a thousand miles away on 30 meters, on 10 megahertz. I um, want to talk a little about camcorders for balloons. <clears throat> There's a neat little camera on the upper left, um, and a lot of RC uh, radio control shops uh, use these. 
sell these and they're anywhere from $29 to $59 and they actually do the video is not that great it's VGA quality but the audio is superb uh, they weigh a half an ounce and I get 30 minutes to an hour out of one of these um, with its internal battery so we're just and I, I just slap tape it onto the side of the payload <clears throat> so for a cheap camera for some fun video, that's a real neat way to go. The Tachyon down below is kind of a competitor of the GoPro, although lately I've uh, been using exclusively the uh, GoPro Heroes. Uh, next slide. This is my uh, <coughs> first flight with a GoPro Hero. We did this at our eighth grade uh, middle school class. We had uh, the entire school came out to the ball field to watch the experiment, to watch the balloon fly. They uh, had a variety of experiments, uh, light bulbs, uh, memory cards, uh, uh, I can remember all the experiments, party balloons filled with different kind of gases, uh, argon and helium and oxygen, nitrogen, and they put the party balloons above the uh, one of the camcorders to record when they burst. Um, and uh, banana slices and I will tell you we flew a whole banana once and that is one of the neatest things you can fly is bananas it was a nice yellow ready to eat banana before we sent it up when it came back it was all brown and mushy like it had been in a refrigerator for about a year so that was something uh, the uh, Nice thing about the GoPro, I did not put it in its uh, waterproof case because I didn't want it to fog up. Although if you do that, they make uh, desiccant inserts that you probably want to put in there. I just exposed the lens to the outside, uh, but you want to make sure it's a very wide angle lens, it's 170 degrees. You want to make sure it's sticking out beyond the edge of the payload which explains my uh, styrofoam igloo effect. Uh, lift up was on the, lift off is on the left, showing about 800 bits in the uh, ball field. Uh, they actually pulled the fire alarm, so all the classes had to go out and watch the launch. Uh, the upper right-hand cor corner is 85,000 feet, uh, the view from the GoPro. And I really like this last picture on the bottom right. That is four feet from hitting the ground, just a fraction of a second, second from hitting the ground. Uh, next slide. Now this, um, I'm wondering if uh, you can run 918 megahertz telemetry in the UK. Is that uh, what we're able to do? We, we can't do that. We can do 868 megahertz. They often make the same, the same brand often has... 950 and 868. 8, 868, did you say? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I will have to check to see if they make the uh, the XB Pro XSC is uh, a 100 milliwatt uh, transmitter on a Zigbee. <coughs> now the top one, uh, the one is puts out one watt. And we can get 100 miles or more uh, telemetry at 9600 baud or 115 k baud with that one. Uh, I had really good success with that. But I decided to see, I use Zigbee modules on gigahertz to communicate between pins so I don't have wires stringing between multiple payloads. And it works great for that. And then I found this 915 megahertz, 100 milliwatt Zigbee unit, because most of them are 10 milliwatts or 1 milliwatt. But, but 100 milliwatts, I thought, you know, that could probably make it down to the ground, and then, then some. So I did the path loss calculations, and I figured you could get it out to 40, 50, maybe 60 miles if you had a gain antenna on the ground. So I tried it, I sent it up, and I was able to get uh, pretty decent communications from uh, 20 miles away, it didn't go any farther than that because it was a summer day and it stayed right overhead. 
but 20 miles directly above me with just the standard width antenna, so I was off the end of the vertical radiators, which is not a good place to be. On the ground, I had an 8 dB patch antenna, and I got about 50% communications with it. Uh, with the gain antenna, it would have been 100%, particularly if it was off angle and I was uh, not directly below the vertical radiator. Uh, but that's, that is a quite a nice system for, and it's cheap. They're like $39 a piece. And uh, you can get nice, about 4,800 uh, baud out of them probably. They're, they're rated at 9,600 baud. Um, next slide. So Zigbee to ground. Uh, you can um, see the size comparison between my transmitter and the Zigbee. I actually send a serial output from my board, and I was feeding that into the Zigbee. So I can actually send down my uh, uh, transmission on the uh, uh, VHF bands on my multi mode transmitter or HF, and then also uh, send down uh, the GPS data string via the Zigbee module. There's the patch antenna I use to uh, receive the, uh, the flight from 20 miles away. Uh, next slide. Now, if you really want to improve things, uh, use this uh, little wheel, uh, Oiled Antenna Labs. Uh, it's sold by hamtv.com. Uh, that is a What's known as a big wheel, it's a clover leaf, it's omni horizontal. The nice thing about this, it will also work very well for you all using the 434 megahertz band because underneath of it there is no null point. It is a nice hemispherical pattern. They, there's a couple of minor nulls, but it's a circular pattern underneath. So, the worst case, you'll lose 3 dB. And then when you're at the horizon, you get maximum power. I fly, fly these when I'm running amateur television on 434 because uh, the superior pattern below the balloon. Uh, next slide. And he will customize them to, if he wanted to customize the 868, uh, he will tune them to frequency. <coughs> I uh, recently uh, bought a device uh, called IO Bridge and uh, I paired it up with LogMeIn.com. There's a free version of LogMeIn that you can control your home computer. Uh, and I've also been using TeamViewer. Uh, TeamViewer works very well as, as well, and it's free too. Um, I bought the pay version of LogMeIn for my one computer because the audio from it, which you can only get with the pay version, is superior to Skype. It really is phenomenal audio. Uh, but it's quite expensive. It's like $50 a computer for the whole year. So, um, But I do have the paid version to log me in for my, uh, my ground station. Um, but for the free version, you just log on to your home computer and then Skype yourself from that computer and then you've got your audio as well. And you can do the same thing with the computer. Uh, so then you can control everything in your shack uh, remotely, your radio and your, uh, your FL Digi. Uh, I do this while I'm driving around using a, you know, a cellular modem in my car and a notebook. And I can be out in the boonies chasing a balloon and I can uh, adjust the antennas and control the radio back on top of the mountain here. Uh, next slide. This is uh, what I used to control my uh, ASL mounted antennas. And uh, it's a device by IO Bridge. Um, it plugs into your Ethernet uh, on your router. And uh, it takes care of all the firewall issues and all the right issues. You actually go to a website. And they give you different scripts that you can embed in your own website for buttons to push. So I have up, down, left, right buttons on a little web page that uh, I can control my antenna and it feeds back the direction to me and I can do that while driving around the car. Uh, next slide.
Here, uh, shows uh, hooked up to my Yesu uh, as L rotor. I just plug into the accessory port uh, in the back, and there's four relays, four relays modules that plug into the Iowa bridge. And there you have it. You have a, a manually controlled uh, remote uh, as L pointing mechanism. Uh, next slide. I wanted to, I've been doing field balloon uh, for the past four years. And we sent up a demonstrator transmitter or sometimes a simplex parrot repeater or a crossband repeater. And uh, it's really fun to link all the field day sites together. We don't get points for it, but uh, it's a great demonstrator for high altitude ballooning in a very public uh, arena during field day. So uh, uh, we uh, are blessed in Huntsville in that I have access to a 40-foot tall enclosed high bay to inflate balloons. Um, this is the National Space Science Technology Center and it's uh, in the background you can see a thousand pound balloon payload. This is where they assemble the 4,000 pound balloon payloads with the telescopes that go out and sensors that go out to the uh, uh, big balloons that they fly out of Texas and uh, New Mexico. So this is one of the places that they do a number of experiments. So it's very appropriate that we get to share our very small, tiny balloons with the big boys. Uh, next slide. This is where they launch the, uh, every week they launch an ozone monitoring balloon, which looks like a beer cooler. Inside has a pump that uh, pumps uh, the air through uh, potassium iodide and they measure the current to detect ozone. There's only four sites in the United States that do this, uh, but they do monitor this worldwide and I'll have to see if there are some in Europe. Uh, pretty sure there are. Um, the neat thing is uh, they have some excess lift. So if I can keep my payload experiment under 10 ounces, I get a free ride every Saturday. And I have flown uh, 30 free rides in the past uh, three years with them to test out different things. Not only that, if I do recover it, I usually do when I have a, one of my tracking transmitters on it, uh, they give me $30 to return the thing back to Boulder, Colorado. Pays <laughs> so, for my gas money. Uh, this is the uh, people at field day watching the uh, watching the parachute as it came down across the uh, field day site, and we could see that thing come in for at least ten minutes. Uh, next next slide. <coughs> this shows the uh, field day site and where it actually landed, just three quarters of a mile apart. It landed, however, right in the middle of Lady Anne Lake. The uh, curious thing is, uh, just a mile to the southeast is where a balloon I launched two years ago during the same date on field day landed. Only that landed 200 feet inside of the military base. And it's still hanging in the tree uh, from uh, four years ago. And that had a lot of equipment. It had a simplex uh, repeater on it and uh, tracking equipment, two trackers. But since I work out there, I didn't want to risk my security clearance by telling them I'd drop something onto the base. So it's still there. One of these days I'll work up the nerve to ask them to, well, unfortunately, I think it's on a bombing range. So. <laughs> I think it's probably left well enough alone. Uh, next slide. When we got to the lake, uh, we found that it was floating right smack dab in the middle of the lake. And it was actually still transmitting. So uh, we were tempted to go out and swim out to it. And we found this kayak sitting next to uh, where we were standing in the little park. So we asked the owner of the kayak if we could use it, and he said, sure, go ahead. Well, when uh, one of our team members, Ethan, walk, 
paddled about halfway out there, he the guy that lived there mentioned, oh, by the way, there's alligators out there. <laughs> We didn't tell Ethan until he had recovered the tailors and came back. We figured it was already too late. Uh, next slide. This is the field day we did just this past uh, June. And um, and we had a very unique uh, AMSAT station here with uh, a very capable uh, Azel mount and boy did it pull in the signals. We had a great signal from this one. Uh, next slide. <laughs> we almost always land into trees. I'm pretty sure I have a tree sensor on most of my payloads. I can, land, I can land in a field, a thousand acre field, with just one tree in the middle of it, and I will always land in that tree. Almost guaranteed. Fortunately, I have Shane uh, Wilson, N4XWC, as on my chase crew, and he just loves to climb trees. So, uh, he's got tree climbing equipment, and he repelled up uh, 70 or 80 feet in one of my last uh, flights to rescue everything. So he's good to have along. Uh, I found another good source of tree climbers are uh, college students. Expendable. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next. Uh, next slide. Ah, I wanted to mention a, a simple tracker, which will probably be very appropriate to uh, those in the UK here. Uh, there is a little transmitter from sparkfun.com for $4. It's on 433.92 megahertz. You can adjust it anywhere from about 5 milliwatts to about 20 or 30, depending on the uh, supply voltage you give it. And this is about as cheap and simple of a tracker as you're likely to put together. We had a competition from hackerspaces in space to come up with the cheapest payload uh, and take a photo from the edge of space as cheaply as possible. They also had a, a neat little addition to the competition in that uh, you had to, uh, the recovery from launch to recovery was timed. So uh, at, if the quickest recovery got extra points. So uh, we landed in a tree and the clock was ticking. It was 70 feet up. So the uh, owner of the uh, tree, he said, well, wait, wait right there. He came back with a chainsaw, <laughs> sawed it down, and we reached right up and got it. <laughs> Now, you, I used an Arduino in this case, and all I'm doing is keying on and off the data line. This, this will, uh, you can set it up to just do straight Morse code, or one uh, technique, they do drift. They drift uh, 10 to 20 kilohertz during a mission. But if you uh, pulse width modulate the input with an audio tone, and you speed it a square wave, you get beautiful AM modulation. So I can send teletype, domino EX, any multi frequency shift key mode I can send this way and receive it on AM mode. Um, it solves the drift problem. You don't even notice the drift when you're listening to it on AM. Um, and you can use all of those wonderful uh, different modes. Now, the next thing is, um, I use a Kenwood TH-F6A to, re to receive it with an arrow antenna on the ground, that's all you need. Uh, 
it, it does take a little bit more gain, however. That's the only drawback. I can also key it on and off as Morse code, so those that want a weak, weaker signal work for that too. But this is an alternative um, and a very easy tracker. Um, I've been using the uh, GPS from uh, the high altitude GPS that's $38 from Argent Data. Combined with this, and you've got a very inexpensive system. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> this is a, a pro actually flew, and, and um, great, uh, a great sleep out, uh, easy recovery. And you can see the, uh, I actually used the Cypress PSOC in this particular version. And you can, that's the size of the module, the transmitter module that says A4, that is the module right there. Um, and I was able to get a beautiful reception from 130 miles away during a recent flight test of this. Now, I want to show you a very unique flight that just recently went up from Santa Barbara, California. Uh, Santa Barbara National History Museum uh, and uh, Fritz, WB9KMO, put together uh, a payload with a 20 meter uh, transmitter that uh, we could hear across the country. Uh, next. The unique thing about this flight is where it was over one minute before landing. The, uh, go to the next slide. That, that is Kilowatt, California. Can you guess why it's called Kilowatt, California? That is a, a big power plant, and they are just a few hundred feet above multiple uh, major transmission lines. Go to the next. And that is the uh, second screen. And somehow it made it through of hot hitting one of them. It actually landed in an aqueduct and floated about a half a mile down the duck. Here's a ways to get a hold of me and uh, and uh, I'll uh, go to a live video for uh, a little show and tell and uh, uh, any questions. Next pair, we'll uh, swap that across. Anybody's got any questions for you? Um, a little bit short on time here, actually. We're getting thrown out of the building in about 29 minutes, so. It's, uh... Okay, I'll be I'll be quick. I just wanted to show you a couple of things. Mm. This is a uh, valve that I use. It's a conduit pipe. I also use this for my pinhole flute. It's very lightweight. It's electrical conduit. The nice thing is, it's got a, a flange opening, and I have a, a little bobber in here for the valve, and I'm going to use this in a spring. I'm going to use this for a Gene Laby floater. This will go in the neck of the balloon, 
and then there's going to be a string to the top inside the balloon and I'm going to attach it to the top of the balloon with super magnets and then it will pull the bobber up when the diameter of the balloon has reached the diameter of the float altitude I want. Dr. Gene Laby did this in the 70s quite successfully with uh, latex balloons. This is an aero antenna. This is what I use in 434 megahertz. The nice thing about this, it's made out of aero shafts. They unscrew. So you can, uh, you can uh, disassemble this. Very compact. 434 may not really need to uh, disassemble. So this is a five element. when I'm in the car. And then uh, one last thing I wanted to show you. Well, the uh, I've been using a new packaging technique for the last two years. And I everything to foam for a board with duct tape. And as we all know, real science is not possible without duct tape. <laughs> now, I have been in this with three layers of small cell bubble wrap. It's extremely light. The bubble wrap acts as a greenhouse effect. And it stays. Freezing in cello that weighs anything. And yeah, uh, you all have seen this. Yeah. Yeah. I think quite a few people have got on bill. I put this on my notebook and uh, I've got uh, an independent um, UHF received in the car. So that's that's my goal with that. I'm trying to get it for, for a long time, but now it's being to uh, I think MLS. Well I've got a lot more to talk about, but I'll let you get back to it since you're getting kicked out of the building. But I've enjoyed uh, checking in with you and uh, participating remotely and uh, look forward to participating in the next one. Maybe I'll show up in person next time. Nice set, long trip though. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for your time. Buddy.